Well, last Lord's Day evening, we began our annual Reformation celebration, which will run to the end of October. The theme this year is Scotland's Second Reformation, and this is an historical period involving Scotland and England that followed after the time and the influence of John Knox. And that became the time when Presbyterianism matured and also even tempered um, under the struggles that uh, those that we now refer to as covenanters experienced. I decided to go ahead with that because um, Presbyterians today do not know much about these spiritual forefathers, and I think it will surprise you as we uh, go along in, in uh, studying about them to learn how their influence affects us even today in many ways, governmentally as well as theologically. Preeminent among those principles has to do with the Bible's teaching that Jesus Christ alone is Lord of the church, head of the church. Now, today, when we think of that principle, the headship of the church, we only think in terms of church government. Uh, if the Roman Catholics, for instance, have their pope. He is Christ's vicar on earth, we're told, and he has apostolic authority, which means he is the head of the church. Other similarly hierarchical kind of church structures and governments may not have one particular person on top, but uh, they do have that pyramid structure, and nonetheless, it's hefty with, uh, loaded with uh, uh, several um, positions of government, uh, authority structures and figures who stand above and apart from the local congregation and their minister. But what we are not used to thinking about is the relationship of a nation's government to that of the church and why it would be that anyone in government would consider it their right to be over the church themselves. To this day, uh, for instance, uh, the Anglican Church worldwide still acknowledges the crown of Great Britain as the head of the church. And that precisely was the issue of victory and success for which the Scottish Presbyterians after the time of John Knox were able to declare a break. For the first time in thousands of years, the state did not control the church. Knox had helped to establish the Church of Scotland by helping to write the Scots Confession, which stated unequivocally that Jesus Christ is the only head of the church. But after the time of Knox passed, the political powers of England, that being specifically the line of the Stuarts, was determined to take control of the church back, not only for economic reasons, but also for theologic reasons as well. And that was the main issue upon which Presbyterians then had to retake their ground. Well, that, of course, involves a lot of history. And uh, in order to grasp the context and impact of that, we're, we have to rehearse that history, but not this morning. Uh, we'll do that in the evening lectures. And the, the morning sermons are going to be focused on the principles that motivated, drove, and led the, the uh, early Presbyterians in the ways they did. And what I want to focus on this morning is answering the question, who is the head of the church? And so for that, I want to address your attention to the book of Colossians and the first 20 verses. Colossians, the letter of Paul to the church in Colossae. This is the word of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, 
since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard... We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in, or in, on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Thus far the reading of God's word this morning. Now in this opening chapter, brothers and sisters, the, Paul does not declare Jesus Christ to be head of the church until verse 18. But it is the build-up to that declaration that teaches us why it is important to recognize and to appreciate that Christ is the head of the church. Paul begins his letter in a very typical style for him. You know, he starts with the address to and from. Uh, he, He adds his blessing to the saints that he is writing to. He showers them with the grace and peace that comes from God the Father. And then third, he expresses his prayer and the recollection of his prayer on behalf of those people in that church specifically, that particular group of believers. And the first thing I want to ask this morning morning is, why does he pray for them this way? Why would he pray for them this way? He, He says, we always thank God when we pray for you. Paul tells the Colossians that he rejoices over all that God has brought into their lives. And how all those blessings have made such a difference to each one of them individually, but also collectively as the body of Christ. He is humbly grateful to God, the Father, for he knows that even he, even the Apostle Paul, could not have given the church those things. He describes three things particularly that they've been given by God. The first is faith in Christ Jesus. Your faith is a gift from Christ. Paul emphasizes that in Ephesians chapter 2 when he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Only the Holy Spirit can turn a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Only the Holy Spirit can make you love and adore God when all you naturally want to do is despise Him. Now still, while faith unto salvation is God's gift, nonetheless, the Scripture is also clear, the act of believing is the duty of the Christian. 
You must believe. Faith, then, is usually defined for us in three ways. First is to grow in your knowledge of the Word of God, and that is a lifelong growth and a lifelong study, that you are to grow in your willingness to trust God for what He teaches and says and instructs, and then you must obey God with what you know He would have you do. And all of those things are things that we struggle and study and seek to do and to grow in as we grow in our own spiritual lives this side of heaven. The faithful ones are the ones who believe, who trust, and who obey. But we could not do those things if the Lord himself had not first come to us. Even in your own particular case, when you cried out to the Lord for salvation, when you cried out to the Lord, enter into my life, when you cried out, Lord, forgive me for the very first time, and you realized something had changed in you, even then the Spirit was already working in your life, already working to draw you to Himself. The second gift that Paul speaks of here is the love for all the saints in verse 4. Love for all the saints. Christians are given a devotion to one another. We're given a body that we can be with, people that we can associate with, people that we can carry the burdens of, people that we can love, minister together. You know, there's always going to be the things that divide Christians. Sometimes those things are doctrinal. Sometimes those things are geographical. Sometimes they're even personal. And when division happens, it hurts us deeply. But even that hurt is a sign that God has given us his desire that we love one another. And that love demonstrates itself to be a gift of God because it is supernatural. That love results in community. Even when we sit here this morning and we have very, very little in common with one another. We come from various social strata. We're different ages, different backgrounds. Some of us talk with different accents than the others. We have all kinds of differences in our lives. The one thing we have in common is the thing that brings us here, our love for Christ and the gift of sharing that love together. It shows also the strength of the community is supernatural. Because down through history, whenever Christians must withstand sacrifice, withstand persecution, withstand the grief of rejection, we have an ability to withstand and to hold together. When Christians will stand with one another in times of abuse or persecution, as well as in times when we are called to defend the gospel and to take a stand for what it says, we see the Lord's hand among us. It's not the courage in our own backbones. This is Christ among us. This is supernatural. A third gift that he speaks of here is hope for and hope in heaven. That's God's promise. Hope for heaven is God's promise to you. You know, what do unbelievers hope in the most? Well, usually their hopes are cast in the negative. They hope they aren't going to suffer. They hope their dying will not be difficult. They surely hope there's not going to be any judgment. Unbelievers, you see, hope in fear. They are afraid of what might come to them. Christian hope is not only definite, it's joyful. We are the children of God. And so we know that God will receive us. Jesus prepares a place for us. So we know we will not hurt. We know we will not be miserable. And we know that the new heavens and the new earth will not come to an end, but will last from age to age to age. 
These are the things, faith, community, and hope, that only God can give to you. And the reason that he would dispense these things to you is because of the victory in Christ that he is declaring and making real to us even two millennia after Jesus went to the cross. Our faith, our community, and our hope bear witness to the truth of the gospel. Man can give you none of those things. You know, we're all on edge today as the time of elections in our nation fast approach. And we're hearing so much verbiage from our politicians and our politicized media. One thing should be very clear to you, especially by this time, for the oldest as well as for the youngest, something should be very evident and obvious to you by now, and that is this. A politician's word means nothing. You, o- you can only judge a politician by what he has done in the past. Politicians speak pleasantly to you. They speak gently to you. They grant you assurances to you. Brothers and sisters, they lie to you because they need to use your trust. They need to use your loyalty in order to gain and keep control and power. There are many historical examples of that, of how those in power have only sought to manipulate the people of God particularly and to take advantage of the gifts that God has given them to suit their own ends, even as at the same time they mock Christianity and they dismiss the reality of the gifts that God has given. They, use, they depend on them. They use them to their own advantage, even as they pretend they're not real. Karl Marx famously wrote, Religion is the opiate of the masses. This famous socialist was actually acknowledging by that phrase that the gifts of God given to Christians are indeed real. So real he was intent on harnessing those gifts for himself and using them to gain control of the nation. What is to stop that from happening here? Well, Paul then goes on to list the benefits that believers receive through these gifts. And this is verses 6 through 8. The believers are in possession of truth. That's the gospel. The truth bears fruit. Christians are to be different in the world. And third, these gifts also yield something else. He says it yields faithful ministers for the church. Now, faithful ministers are defined for us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 where Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You see, in this very brief description, we have the true character of the minister and why it is so important that the church have such a faithful minister. The minister is first held accountable by, to, by Jesus Christ, that he, he is given the charge of preaching the whole counsel of God. That, is, that must be proclaimed by the minister. It must be preached in season and out of season. That is, in other words, when people want to hear what the minister has to say as well as times when they don't want to hear 
what the minister has to say. And that means that the faithful minister must be prepared for pushback. He must be prepared for rejection, not just from the people in the pews, but also from the politicians who want to manipulate the nation, manipulate the ministers by telling and forcing them to say what the government wants them to say and not to tell, tell people what the government doesn't want people to hear. The government will always aim to control the church and to control the minister for its own purposes of propaganda. The faithful minister must be prepared to resist outside manipulation and control. And then in verses 9 to 14, Paul says he will continue to pray for the continuing gifts that will surely come to the church that commits to be faithful to Christ. The church, he says, will gain the full knowledge of God's will. Spiritual wisdom and understanding are not things that come from man. They can only come from studying the Word and depending on and leaning on the Holy Spirit. Those people of God will walk worthy of the Lord. They, seek, they will seek to honor the Lord in their lives and recognize and uphold Jesus Christ as Lord in order to see the kingdom of God increase. And the fruit of their effort will be good. First, in the many ways that strengthen their faith, their community, and their hope, but then also the strength in the nation that does not seek to control the church, but to be blessed and guided by the church as the church seeks to be faithful to Christ. Now, the point of all this is very evident by now. Jesus Christ is everything. He is our all in all. He is the giver of every good and perfect gift. He is everything man cannot be. Whereas man is made in the image of God, and that alone should call all mankind to honor his God in every way possible, it is Jesus who is the very image of God, and he alone is worthy to receive blessing and honor and power and glory. No king on earth should ever think or dare to take on any of those things, especially in the name of Christ on earth. But sadly, that is what we see again and again. The church in history throughout and the various forms of governments and nations, it seems like there's one or two things that happen. The church is either subsumed under the crown when the head of that nation declares himself to then also be the head of the church, or else, as has happened in our country, church and state have become so divided and so separated that the truth of God's word is not at all welcome in the public forum now at all. We are told now boldly and frankly that one's faith in Jesus Christ has no place in politics, no place in the judiciary, and that one who does have such a faith is therefore disqualified from serving his country. And Christians have not been faithful to stand up to this kind of prejudice and to resist, resist it at the polls. But as Paul declares in verse 18, Jesus Christ is the head of the church so that in everything, he might be preeminent. Jesus Christ is preeminent. That means he's over everything. As Paul says, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, and that is because not only all things were created through him, but that he is and will be the judge of all the earth. Psalm 2 that we've already heard is just one place in Scripture that speaks clearly about that. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. 
He who sits in heaven laughs. As for me, I have set my king. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned. O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear. Kiss the son, lest you, he be angry and you perish in the way. This is an ominous, but a very gracious warning from God. And just as it has been given to nations past, it is now given to the United States of America because this nation is raging and the peoples are plotting in vain. The Lord is to be acknowledged as the King of kings and Lord of lords before he smashes this nation like a potter's vessel. But even though Christ is to be acknowledged by the nations, he first must be acknowledged by the church. Too many professing Christians have stopped living by faith. Stopped living by the conviction that they get when they read the Word of God. In order to return to a true and saving faith, you must repent of sins like that. You must submit yourself again in all things, to the Lord your Savior. Too many Christians today have abandoned the community of the faithful. They are content and satisfied to be on their own. They, they don't feel the need for community, uh, to, to be supportive and, in, and, to be, and to serve in ministry and in service. They just don't want to bother with other Christians. They too must repent of their selfishness. And as a result of forsaking those first two gifts, too many Christians today have also forsaken the gift of hope. Christian hope, my friends, is not something you lose. You cannot lose the promise of God. But it is something you can abandon. And when you choose not to live by faith, when you choose to reject the community of the faithful, you abandon hope. These Christians must repent of this also. Your Lord is calling you. Return to him. Kiss the sun. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the Lord, the head of the church. And that means your, your word is our constitution and our marching orders. And you have required of us not only to embrace with joy the gifts that you give to us of faith and of community and of hope, but to use them, Lord, to the glory of yourself and to be obedient as your servants in the world in which we find ourselves. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would enable us to take a stand when a stand is necessary. That you would enable us to say our Christian faith drives everything, every choice, every decision, every moment in our lives. That we do not compartmentalize our faith so we get along with somebody else. We do what you've called us to do, and that is what makes the difference. We thank you for such wonderful blessings. We know that man can't give us these things, no matter how many promises he makes. You have given them to us already. You have made us rich with the wealth of the Spirit of God. And Lord, we pray that we might remember the pearl of great price and rejoice in it alone Hear us, O Lord. Call us back to yourself, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.